Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to a brand new video. Today, we're taking a look at this sound. Alright, so thank you very much for choosing this video as the next one that you're going to be watching. And yeah, let's hop in the tutorial. So, the sound itself starts as a harmer. Alright, so... Since this is very old, I didn't use a patcher for this one. So we're going to go step by step. This is what we are automating. So we are just automating filters, nothing special, nothing very, very complex. So inside the Harmer, this is the, the original patch. So it's just a square ease. For some reason, I used a little bit of pan. I, by the way, I'm going to be saying for some reason quite a lot in this tutorial because I don't quite remember why I did things like the way they did. I just kind of was looking for projects um, and cool bass sounds that I had to make a tutorial on and I found this one. So I was like, yeah, why not? But I don't really remember why I did things this way. So I'm kind of just showing what it does rather than why I did it. Uh, because honestly, I don't remember. I have harmonic protection engaged for some reason. That's that might be because I wanted to limit the amount that the f uh, of effect that the phaser had on the, the square harmonics. I don't really know why I used pen on the the unison, but I guess I wanted some stereo width. Uh, the pitch and phase, it's normal stuff. It's just you know res stuff. Then I have cube distortion instead of logarithmic, so I perhaps didn't want a very strong one because logarithmic distortion is by far the, f the hardest distortion in here. Some chorus, some reverb and multiband compression to give it some space. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So then we have a band pass, two notches, yeah, three notches. So... The whole bass is based around one band pass and three notches, which are all being automated and doing their crazy things. And then some heavy ass distortion and some multiband compression. I didn't take the mids too much, but I boosted the highs and the lows a lot and boosted the whole bass crap ton. Then it's just going into the side chain and going out. So it's a very simple bass actually but the reason why i'm actually showing you this space is because uh in context it's used in a way that it's not really that common which is this bass is actually used both solo and as a layer to another sound and <clears throat> i want to go about the my thought process of how do you use neuro bases as layers for multiple neural bases and how should you work the movement of those said bases and in order to make something really big and monstrous. So basically, uh, in context, this is what it is. And I also have this pattern here, as you can see. So, <clears throat> basically, uh, it's a quite a big bass thing. Um, the idea is that this is a bass that by itself, although it's pretty cool and very useful, the harmonic presence of the bass, as you can see, it's, it's very selective. What I mean by this is it either has the full spectrum or just the low end. And when it has the full spectrum, you have a really strong emphasis on the high end, right? What this allows you to do is select when you just want to have this bass as a low end bass or a bass that shows all of it by itself. So <clears throat> just so I can show you guys what this bass sounds in context, this is like the the second drop of uh, a little song that I was working on years ago. So I'm just gonna unmute this. Wow. 
right, so that's pretty much what matters, right? So we have some context here. So what is happening here? I have another harmer. As you can see, supposedly it would be, you know, all fucked up, but I just chose the square wave instead. So it's not really... So, as you can see, this second harmer is far more complex. So we start with the band pass. And the first thing that I want to say is when you are layering neurobases, because this is surprisingly useful, although it's not very, it's not very commonly used because it's, you know, a lot of effort. Uh, not only just doing sound design for one Eurobase, you have to make another one and then somehow merge them together in this weird glue of sound. It's, it, it's a pain in the butt, but it yells really good results as I can kind of demonstrate here. So one of the things is, is you have to know how to select the, the frequency space for each bass at each time. And this is where kind of the most difficult part of things lie, because if you have two neural bases that are competing on the low end all the time, essentially you're just going to have a mess, and it's going to be hard to mix, it's not going to sound very pleasant. So knowing how to select which part of the bass is interacting with the other part of the bass, it's very important. So that's kind of why I said it was relevant to know that this, this bass was either fully low end or full spectrum. And if it is full spectrum, there's no particular, you know, characteristic that defines it rather than the high end. And the high end is just, you know, the high end, so you can go with whatever. So, and the reason that it can go with whatever is because uh, the phase cancellation does not create rumble in the high end because the frequency is so high, right, that you can't, you can't even notice it. So then I have some distortion. Uh, I'm just going to show you guys the main patch first because it's honestly just very simple. So it's a square reese. I also have uh, phaser on harmonic mode engaged. I have logarithmic distortion on with some stereo, uh, with some asymmetric distortion. Uh, so it gives it some stereo, stereo dimension because it distorts the left side and right side in different amounts and some multiband compression. So it's something special. Uh, it's a, a rather simple patch. Um, <clears throat> and then I have this band pass. It kind of selects things, right? Um, and you can see that the full bass by itself, it's very faint, but mixed with this other bass, just gives this an, another level of dimension and movement and feel to it. So it's a very clever way of, you know, just increasing the, the you know, the nearness of your neural bases, let's say. So without all the effects, this is what it sounds. So this is a very simple you know, pattern. Heavy distortion. Uh, then some EQ. So notice here that I'm taking a lot of the, the main elements of the bass out. So I'm taking a lot of the bass out. I'm taking a lot of the mids and scooping the mids with the notch while it moves and taking a lot of the high. So I just left like the around 2K a bit uh, untouched. Uh, the reason, the reason for that is I want to have the bass as free as possible, you know, when I want to complement it with this bass. So here I'm notching and peaking. The reason I'm peaking is because I wanted the low end a bit more so I could, you know, further down distort it. Because I actually used the patcher here with a weird processing technique that I used to use. It's fairly cool, but it's a bit of hit or miss. So I kind of dropped it. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the reason I have this peak going on. Then I have some Maximus where I am, wait, 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 uh, where I am just boosting the, the lows and taking out the mids and boosting the highs and the master overall. So MDA, MDA delay, basically this is being used as a comp filter. 
Uh, it's a bit more sophisticated than that because uh, the the delay is very slightly. Uh, the the delay on the right is very slightly larger than the delay on the left. The feedback is set to seventy two percent, and the feedback mix, the the effects mix is set to thirty three percent. So basically, this is the same thing as a comp filter on the um, on Serum. It's nothing special. Uh, and so far. <laughs> This is how it sounds, the whole thing. And now here comes the patcher, which is the weirdest thing of them all. So I have a flanger, a quarters and a phaser, all of them modulating the same sound. So basically what this does is creates movement and destroys, you know, the frequency content of the sound because there's so much modulation going on. I took the, the low end a lot because it was just rumble. I uh, just pretty much took it out. Uh, just left it a little bit there just so I could distort it uh, with this weird shape. Uh, and then I just copied the, the same EQ pretty much and just made a minor, minor, some minor tweaks to it. So as you can see, like this bass is becoming more of a detail rather than a full bass, uh, especially because of the delay here because using comp filters in this specific way allows you to create some some space in the bass itself because it's a if it, it's like a reverb but a very short one um uh, it's not a reverb but it, it it works in the same way as as in gives your bass a lot of of stereo dimension right and since i'm taking out the low end a lot and then filtering a lot, right? The bass loses a lot of its presence and it's kind of sent, kind of sent to the back of the mix. So you can actually use it as a layer once you boost everything up, which I'm doing here. So when I merge this with this one, it's a bit fast because I disabled the one thing that is important to notice is that the rhythm of the the two bases is somewhat similar right um the main rhythmic sources are these two and you can see that they are similar even though they are not quite the same but the peaks and the main movement parts are coincidental so they happen at the exact same time um once these two, which are the main focus, uh, laid, you know, at the same time, they, they happen at the same time, you can kind of variate and deviate from that with other modulation sources, but it's a really cool technique. So, yeah, this has been the, the technique for layering the bass. So, two bases in one. So what's important here to retain after this tutorial? So about the patches themselves, one thing that I want to say is stereo dimension is not really important. I is that it, if it was today that I made this track, I wouldn't choose to apply a lot of stereo dimension and would allow myself to mo to shape that later on in the mix. Um, so I would definitely change the asymmetrical part of things and I would keep try to keep the, the reese bases as, mo as mono as possible for a simple reason because when you start adding reverb and filtering the sound in the mix you can really place them well so if you had a neuro bass and you allowed it to have more presence in the high end whilst you had an another one that was more full bodied or low end, right? Just applying the reverb and some EQing uh, on the high end bass would allow you to place it on the mix at the same time as the other one and not, that, not having them clash with each other. So I'd say take care of your stereo field as a first step when designing your patches. About the patches themselves, this is a pretty standard breeze. I've showed plenty of patches like this on the channel, so I'm not going to go over them a lot. They are very basic. They are not really complex or anything. So I'm just going to move straight past it. Then second part is make sure your rhythmic parts, when it comes to filtering, align. That is very important because that's what 
allows you to have a cohesive bass rather than just a, a mess of modulation and notches and band passes moving. So make sure you have those two parts aligned. Those are the main parts that allow your basses to feel flow, you know, flow together. They, they, that allows you to feel like the basses flow together. That's really important. Then use distortion as a way to decide which bass goes where in when it comes to spectrum and use a lot of filtering to open up space to, for each bass. So on this first one, I used a lot of filtering, but then I distorted and brought everything up. So that's why the bass itself has such presence, right? Was this one has a lot of filtering, right? But doesn't have a lot of distortion. So the, the, the frequencies that appear on the spectrum at, you know, across time are very limited in the sense that they belong to a certain space of frequencies that is very specific and it's very well determined and is used according to my needs when it comes to the layering. So that's another thing that you have to take into account is choose your filtering and distortion wisely to decide when the bases come and go and how they come and go. And then there's a th the third, fourth thing. I don't know. I lost the count. So is use reverb in, in the layers to set them apart from each other. Stereo wise. If you have a base that ha a newer base that happens to it exists more on the high end using comb filters like this, a negative comb filter. Uh, that's what it is. And a lot of modulation and some reverb uh, allows you to put the bass a bit further back. So it works better as a layer because it's not, it, your brain doesn't perceive it as a, a solo bass that's competing with another one. It, it, you kind of recognize it as a part of the other one. So that, that's a cool tip. Use modulation for that. Flangers, chorus, phasers, uh, all of that to kind of destroy the frequency content of the bass uh, itself and allow you to select which parts of the bass come through and, and don't. Um, another thing that you should be using very, very wisely is multiband compression. Here, I would definitely advise Maximus because you can actually shape the way that the multiband compression is going to happen. I wouldn't advise things like OTT because OTT just kind of allows you to bring everything up uh, or down uniformly. Uh, on Maximus, you have a bit more control. You also have this similar control, not similar, but a pretty good amount of control in multiband uh, on the Fab Filters MB, the the Pro MB, that's a pretty good multiband compressor as well. Uh, but as long as it is uh, um, a multiband compressor that allows you to control individual bands with ratios that are well defined, and you can either expand or compress things in the way that you want, uh, that will in my experience, obviously, yield better results than things that are just like OTT that you just slap on and see what happens. It's not really that effective. But yeah, guys, so this has been the tutorial. I'm not really sure what else is relevant. Um, I've gave you guys the context. I've gave you guys the, um, the tips. So I would like to know if you guys found the tutorial useful. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. And <clears throat> if, if, if it, the tutorial was, you know, suitable to any techniques that you're trying to experiment with. I definitely haven't seen a lot of things regarding neural based layers. And this is a very old project where I kind of tried it out. There have been a few other projects where I did similar stuff, but never to the extent that I did here. So I thought this was a, a cool thing to show. So yeah, guys, uh, it's been a week or perhaps more since I last uploaded a video and due to some problems IRL. Uh, so a lot of things have been happening and I've kind of been trying to sort everything out. So. 
all of that and besides some poor time management skills uh, I just couldn't make videos because I didn't manage myself well I had all of the th these things going on and all of that so it was a bit of a train wreck this week and I apologize if I got if I left you guys waiting essentially I hope that regardless the video was useful you guys learned something if you like the video make sure to subscribe and leave a like uh, if you like the content in the channel then make sure you subscribe and yeah that's pretty much it i hope you guys have a nice day and thank you very much for watching and again see you